everyone. Welcome to uh, the NKR6 panel, uh, DPRK post-Ukraine. Uh, so first, we have Mr. Matthew Fleming on the panel. Uh, Matthew is a former intern of mine. Uh, he is doing a joint MA. He just finished at Yonsei, doing the second half of his joint MA at KO. Uh, next up, we have Sila Selene Turkel and Hatis Selik. Uh, first of all, thank you for um, accepting as a speaker to such a wonderful conference. Uh, we will introduce to our presentation titled Remembering North Korea's Nuclear Weapons. These are the contents of our uh, presentation. Uh, the introduction, North Korea in the COVID-19 pandemic and Ukraine war, nuclear development of North Korea towards post-Ukraine and uh, conclusion uh, are the topics of this presentation. Um, I would like to start with uh, showing this photo. Uh, it is published by North, North Korean state media last week. Uh, Kim Jong-un and, and his daughter uh, walk in front of a massive uh, intercontinental ballistic missile. Uh, a lot of speculations have uh, occurred about the photo and the first uh, appearance of the uh, Kim's daughter. Uh, rather than the improving North Korea's uh, image or sig signaling the continuation of the nuclear weapon program, uh, we can interpret this photo as the it shows the uh, North Korea's uh, nuclear development program is a new era, is a new chapter. Uh, maybe we think that she uh, represents this uh, new era uh, on nuclear program of North, North Korea. Uh, not now, uh, as you can see, North Korea's nuclear program is more compatible with modern technology than ever before. Uh, in the first two years uh, of the pandemic, a uh, few countries declared uh, zero cases. Among them, North, North Korea got more attention due to its uh, six nuclear tests uh, between 2006 and 2017, and its ongoing uh, missile test. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, North Korea closed its borders and implemented uh, very strict uh, quarantine conditions. Uh, North Korea saw the pandemic as a matter of national survival. Um, national survival term is uh, important because uh, North Korea's nuclear weapon ambition is also relies on the uh, similar idea. Uh, there is a consideration that uh, we, we should have uh, nuclear weapons weapons to survive while we are surrounding by our enemies. Um, however, North Korea declared its first positive case um, in May uh, 2022. Today, North Korea is one of the countries with the fewest cases and deaths in the pandemic. Uh, but suspicions of the Pyongyang's declaration about the pandemic uh, is continuing. Uh, then North Korea began to seen as a losing to pandemic. Uh, in some points, some uh, speeches of the Kim Jong-un and the action of uh, Pyongyang uh, supported the international media's uh, pessimistic view. For example, for example, Kim Jong-un uh, referred to the arduous march to the cope with the economic uh, difficulties due to the pandemic. Uh, the arduous march is the other name of uh, North Korean famine of 1999, uh, in which hundreds of thousands of people died. On the other hand, uh, the world began to take uh, to issue seriously. Uh, Russia's embassy in um, North Korea said that the country is suffering uh, from a severe shortage of medicine and necessary goods. Uh, UNICEF sent uh, medical goods for the treatment of children. Uh, moreover, since the beginning of the uh, pandemic, South Korea uh, has called for vaccine assistance uh, to Pyongyang. 
Meanwhile, uh, North Korea's measures in combating the pandemic were, dis were very strict. Uh, the first reaction of the regime was, the, uh, was to isolate the country from the international community. In 2021, Pyongyang did not allow foreign visitors to enter the country. Uh, in addition, accredited diplomats and employees of the non-governmental organization had to leave the country. Uh, thinking about the absence of the international community in a, a possible humanitarian tragedy in North Korea, neither um, an NGO, an NGOs or nor a country uh, could have had the country, the North Korea. Victor Cha, the one of the supporters of the pessimistic view at the begin beginning of the 2021, stated that if foreign aid does, does not arrive soon, North Korea will soon enter into domestic turmoil. In North Korea, however, the situation was uh, suddenly reversed again. Uh, in the middle of the 2022, Kim Jong-un declared victory over the pandemic. Uh, furthermore, Kim Yo-jong, Kim Jong-un's sister and the uh, uh, North Korean politician claimed that South Korea was re responsible for the COVID-19 cases. Uh, as a result, there is, a, there is no pandemic, but also there is no foreigner in the country. Uh, thus, as avoiding the international surveillance, North Korea conducted more missile tests than ever before. Uh, in fact, US and the South Korean officials had expressed their concerns about the util uh, possible utilizations of the Ukraine crisis by the Pyongyang regime. For example, uh, before the election in March 2022, Yoon uh, Sokyol uh, wrote in his Facebook page um, that above all, while the US is focusing on Europe, there's, there's a possibility that North Korea will conduct strategic provocations, provocation, provocations such as ballistic missiles, as well as lo local provocations near the borders. As Yoon's uh, prediction, we can also predict that what happened when the whole world turned in its attention to Ukraine. Um, first of all, other issues dealing with the global security have been laid aside for a while. International economic and political sanctions against North Korea would remain insufficient, insufficient when, even if they continue. Uh, meanwhile, North Korea's nuclear missile technology is rapidly advanced. As a result, uh, considering the, of course, lack, uh, lack of data, North Korea might have enough missile material to conduct, construct 45, 55 uh, nuclear weapons and might have produced 20, 30 warheads. But we should also uh, examine how the pandemic and the Ukraine crisis have triggered uh, North, Korea's, North Korea to speed up its nuclear weapons, weapon program. The pandemic was a threat to North Korean regime. Poor economic, uh, health, poor economic and health conditions uh, could not handle the burden of a severe pandemic. Moreover, the closing of its borders as a part of the pandemic measures hindered the trade with the China, which, which is uh, vital for the maintenance of the regime. Pyongyang's government had to prevent the spread of pandemic while within the country by strict measures, but the measures would worsen the economy. Uh, from North Korea's, North Korea's point of view, the country would have been vulnerable to foreign intervention in this dilemma. When we came to, um, sorry, as a result, in thus, North Korea has tried to draw attention to its military capability and speed up nuclear weapons development program. Uh, Pyongyang desired to show its power to both uh, North Korean society and international actors. When we came to Ukraine crisis, uh, four issues dealing with the Ukraine war have, con have made convinced North Korea to gain more speed 
uh, with missile test. Firstly, uh, North Korea may consider that nuclear ownership may prevent its uh, possible invasion, unlike Ukraine. If Ukraine had a nuclear arsenal or joined NATO, uh, which just provide nuclear uh, protect protection, Russia would probably not have intervened in Ukraine. Uh, sec secondly, North Korea has witnessed uh, China's unwillingness to provide political and military support to Putin's uh, aggressive attack. It can be observed that China will consider its uh, national interest in possible conflicts on the uh, Korean Peninsula. If North Korea becomes the first attacker or the US and uh, South Korea start a conflict, um, China may not stand by North Korea. Thirdly, uh, North Korea has seen Russia's active use of uh, deterrence policy. Uh, North Korea may estimate that North Korea nuclear weapons will threaten the US and uh, South Korea and make them hesitate during the, any conflict in the uh, peninsula. Finally, uh, the current demand for nuclear weapons in Northeast Asia will justify North Korea's nuclear weapons strategy, either the nuclearization of Japan and South Korea or the deployment of uh, U.S.'s nuclear weapons uh, to its allies. Uh, any arms race in the region will prevent uh, nuclear disarmament of North Korea. When we came to conclusion, uh, considering the declaration of the Kim Jong-un in January uh, 2021, uh, North Korea has tried hard to enhance its nuclear deterrence capability. As advancing nuclear weapon technology, North Korea wants to be accepted as a, a nuclear power and enjoy its uh, maneuvering capability in the future negotiations with the US but it will risk the peace and secu security in the Korean Peninsula. Mo mo moreover, again, the denuclearization of North Korea will likely become impossible. North Korea officialized uh, its nuclear strategy with the law on consol consolidating its, the position of nuclear weapon states in 20, uh, 2013. This law must was replaced with the law on DPRK's policies, policy on nuclear forces promulgated on September 8, 2022. After the adoption of law, uh, Kim Jong-un declared that a law makes North Korea's nuclear status irreversible and uh, recent uh, successive mil uh, missile tests prove North Korea wants to be accepted as a nuclear state. Uh, a missing part in the evolutions, um, actually, uh, in media, uh, is the role of uh, the MPT. Between 1985 and 2003, North Korea was a part of the treaty. Then the MPT became the core of disarmament negotiations with the Pyongyang during the six party talks. Uh, UN Security Council's resolutions have repeatedly called for North Korea to return the treaty. However, the NPT has been underestimated by the international community through the COVID-19 period and the Ukraine crisis. Then the 10th uh, NPT review conference was postponed in 2020 due to the COVID-19 and then ended without the participation's agreement in August 2022. Moreover, the international um, the community's react recognition of a country as a legitimate nuclear weapon state is actually related to the NPT regime. The US, Russia, China, France, and uh, UK are accepted as a nuclear weapon state, and they are employed to employed to prohibit the proliferation of the nuclear weapons by the treaty. The international community insists North Korea to return MPT with abandoning its nuclear 
weapon, weapon program. On the other hand, if North Korea wants to be a nuclear weapon state, the state should, should also return the NPT. Uh, but recognizing North Korea, North Korea's nuclear status will not bring peace uh, to Northeast Asia nor the world. Uh, what we need to know as a conclusion, the concept of a nuclear weapon state and non-nuclear non weapon state should be uh, critically questioned to deal with the nuclear uh, threat. Thank you for listening. Okay, so yeah, like the professor said, my name is Matthew Fleming. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about denuclearization and DPRK, very similar topic as the one just presented on. But most specifically, I wanted to lean further into the title of this conference, which is a new world disorder, and specifically looking at how denuclearization and the DPRK has evolved or post Russia invasion into Ukraine, specifically having a conversation on security assurances and nuclear deterrence in general. So. This presentation is going to follow a five part structure similar to the five chapter structure of the paper that it is based on, starting off with the introduction and purpose statement, moving into a review of the NPT's agreements and limited security scope, and then talking about the cases of Ukraine and the DPRK with a specific focus on the security assurances and their similarities. Then moving into the final part of the presentation will be the argumentative section, specifically looking at how Russia's invasion has impacted the perceptions of denuclearization and security assurances, and then some possible developments that we could see transpiring with denuclearization negotiations with the DPRK. So to put it more succinctly, the purpose of this paper is to elevate the discussion on denuclearizations with the DPRK by highlighting the comparative security assurances that were given to Ukraine that were broken by the Russia invasion to the assurances presented and offered to the DPRK in exchange for their possible denuclearization. Not only through this comparison will a presentation of similarities and utilization of security assurances role and security be observed, but also the discussion and evolution for the need of changes in negotiation practices around security will be presented for further debate. So starting off with the foundation for the logical statements of this paper and for this idea is the Treaty of non of Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, or the NPT. The NPT still remains the most significant and ratified arms limitation disagreement, uh, disarmament agreement, and with their espoused goal to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons and weapons technology while promoting peaceful uses of nuclear energy and nuclear disarmament, the NPT has worked as a centralizing denuclearization negotiations by basically focusing all of denuclearization movement on utilizing this as the main negotiation tool, basically ascension as a non-nuclear state through the NPT. Therefore, to understand a country's history and progress with denuclearizing, we also have to understand its relationship with the NPT in general. Now, while the NPT is very significant and impactful, like we have outlined, the act of ascension to the treaty should not be seen as fully encompassing of all the negotiations that take place and that larger effort as a whole. Most specifically, if you subscribe to a neo-realist interpretation of a world built on an anarcho system or security maximization, we would no notice that NPT continues to have a limited security scope, specifically around the idea of nuclear deterrence. Now, nuclear deterrence is a leading, if not the leading, security measure a country can hold, as nuclear weapons can dissuade states from going to war more surely than any kind of conventional means would have. So with the NPT only holding limited um, forms of assurances, specifically talking about nuclear weapons, not against other nuclear states, it further verifies and justifies observations of looking at where other assurances that are attempting to address the security scope and their importance. Specifically, the number one tool used to address these aspects of security has been security assurances. Now, while security assurances are quite prolific in bilateral and multilateral forms in different disciplines. In the scope of a commitment to security, security assurances have been classified into two groups of forms, negative assurances and positive assurances. A negative assurance is an agreement, commitment, or basically an assurance to one party that they will refrain from a certain action. This is negative as it is taking something off the field. They are removing something such as we have no intentions of invading. We have no intentions of doing X. 
Conversely, a positive assurance is the agreement commitment to do something in the event of an outline situation, such as we will retaliate if X is involved. If someone invades here, we will reply. This is a positive assurance because it is promoting the addition of an action. Now, colloquially, a negative assurance is what people are referring to when we speak on this idea of security assurances, while positive assurances are more referred to as a security guarantee. Now, these security guarantees or a positive security guarantee is more legally binding framework compared to the more perspective of a espousing of a lack of intent that a negative assurance does. And so positive guarantees are usually a lot harder and a lot rarer to see. And similarly is the same type of stuff when we talk about a nuclear umbrella. And so when we look at the cases uh, for us today, starting with Ukraine, Ukraine's history with the NPT is a very divergent case from the stereotypical uh, version of what we're used to as they were part of the Soviet Union during the initial formulation of the treaty. It wasn't until post dissolving of the Soviet Union that then they gaining their sovereignty and independence in 1991 did discussions really start to transpire with Ukraine. Now, at this time, Ukraine inherited 15% of the Soviet Union's former nuclear arsenal and made it a very significant holder. Now, while there's academic debate regarding about the maintenance, the capabilities and the infrastructure of these nuclear arsenal from a denuclearization movement and the idea of nonproliferation, what is important is that the arsenal was there and that it could maybe work towards capitalizing or that it could spread to other areas. So regardless of the perception of this debate, what was important was that there was nuclear weapons there that needed to be addressed from this denuclearization movement. And so with various factors at play, such as strengthening their broadening ties, their economic pursuits, and basically they decided to pursue ascension through the NPT denuclearizing. This was in 1994. However, during their ascension to the NPT, they also um, signed the, a trilateral statement with Russia and the United States, as well as the Budapest Memorandum. Now, the importance of for Ukraine, keeping nuclear weapons would mean isolations and sanctions and basically being isolated from the rest of the world, while accepting the, into the NPT meant international recognition and acceptance to the international economy. So from an economic and a political aspect, it made perfect sense to join through the NPT. However, with the limited security aspects for the denuclearization, it did not account for the security situation that Ukraine still existed under enter in this form of the Budapest in 1994, the, mem the Memorandum on Security Assurances. Now, in these assurances, it was outlined that Russia, the United States, as well as Ireland and the United Kingdom would respect the independence and sovereignty of the existing borders of Ukraine. By doing such, they added on to these other ideas to where they were able to join the Western leading political sphere and make economic growth a desired while addressing the security concerns that were outlined through these additions of negative security assurances. Now, compared with the addition of the DPRK, similar to the Ukraine situation is just as divergent from the stereotypical perception of what happens for the NPT. Joining the treaty in 1985, it wasn't until six years later that safeguards from the IAEA was able to be implemented in 1992. In 1993, the DPRK announced its intentions to withdraw from the treaty after the IAEA EA basically announced that nuclear activity was more extensive than they were declaring. They were actually formally left the treaty in 2003, despite the efforts from the US and North Korean agreement framework. And it, even though in 2005, the DPRK did say that they pledged to end all their nuclear activities again, due to the implementation of the six party talks. However, since then, we have continued to see the restarting of facilities, the increasing rocket launches and the underground nuclear tests. So with the international community continuing to try to attempt to bring the DPR back towards a path towards denuclearization and nonproliferation, a big issue that happens in addition to the political and uh, economic aspect is the security aspect. As the DPRK have similar concerns to their security as Ukraine did at that moment, trying to protect their sovereignty and their borders, specifically towards the United States with their involvement in the Korean War and their growing interest and alliance with the South Korea. During the U.S. agreed framework in 1994, the United States did offer formal commitments of secure, negative security assurances to the DPRK, saying they had no intentions of invading, in addition to form full normalization of political and economic relations. 
How, and this is very similar to the same ones that were offered to Ukraine, basically saying that we will recognize your sovereignty, we will recognize your borders, and basically we have no intent of attacking. Similar in 2005 with the six-party talks, the United States made multiple negative security assurance pledges on around the idea that they would not only not attend to attack or invade with nuclear weapons, but also conventional weapons, broadening the NPT's built-in security assurances to these more conventional means, giving them more form of negative assurances. So while economic means, political means, and sanction lifting are all critical parts of the negotiation aspect, security assurances of the negative variety continue to be the go-to method for addressing this aspect of security that is so critical to the denuclearization negotiation process. And so this leads us to the more argumentative section that I want to cover is that in a post-Russia invasion of Ukraine, the use of accompanying negative negative security assurances to persuade countries into denuclearizing through the NPT has drastically decreased the negotiation validity while increasing the positive perception of the necessity of nuclear weapons for deterrence. Therefore, the approaches to denuclearization negotiations with the DPRK are forced to evolve to meet these diminishments and perceived value of negative security assurances as a negotiation tool and perspectives of a desire to retain their own nuclear deterrence. Now, I'm going to break these up into their two key points here, starting with the vindication and the belief of nuclear deterrent. The breaking of the assurances given to Ukraine in the Budapest was only further solidified by the DPR's stances for necessary nuclear development arsenals as the cornerstone for their security framework. I like this, the quote from Dr. Scott Sagan when he says that nuclear weapons are not just a force used to deter another state from attacking, but also a shield behind one which can engage in aggression. While the inability for security assurances to make up the lack of security lost from nuclear deterrence is not only an aspect that vindicates the belief for nuclear deterrence, but also the Western's uh, hesitation to directly involve with Russia's uh, ambitions helps promote this this basically this use for a gauge of aggression. Now, while these are already ideas that are quite known in theory, and anyone who studies neorealism or nuclear deterrence would understand these concepts, what's important for us to pay attention to here is the development of a recent example for the DPRK to point to, and that is internationally relevant that justifies this stance for negotiations moving forward. And it will have significant consequences on future dialogues, and you cannot expect for it not to be referenced. So, and this leading into the diminishment of security assurances in general and the per perception of the value of NPT. With security being critically linked to nuclear deterrence and these denuclearization topics, if the perceived usefulness of the method that is used to cease these security concerns is diminished, then it is impossible for us not to say that the negotiation validity has also been diminished. This is something that leading government officials and scholars have already started alluding to, such as stating that the status quo ante for Europe is gone forever, as well as we, Ukraine, gave up the capabilities for nothing. That's coming from the Ukraine defense minister himself, equating security assurances that they signed as nothingness. When states themselves are equating their agreements to being worth nothing, there's no way that you can say the perception of the value of those agreements have not been diminished therefore diminishing their, their future negotiation validity if they are used in the same type. So with these ideas in mind, it makes us wonder what are the possible developments we can see for future negotiations with the DPRK. And I've highlighted two for this presentation, which is the further development and support towards a reluctance to negotiate in general. The DBRK has already existed as a non-legitimate nuclear state for multiple years. And with this already further entrenchment in this idea that they need nuclear deterrence as the cornerstone for their security framework and the devalue of the main tool that is being utilized to try to fix the security concern for denuclearizing, losing validity, there is a high possibility that it will be increasingly difficult to even bring them to the table. Specifically, something that the last presentation even mentioned was the new law that the DPRK implemented in September, further solidifying this idea that they're becoming even more entrenched and enshrining the right for preemptive strikes for the value that the nuclear weapons have for this regime. And so this is a very possible way and something we've already starting to see develop in the last couple of months. But if negotiations do not stall out, Another possible development we could see is the increased desire and requirement for more legally binding negotiations of positive assurances. We could see the shift moving from negative to positive, and arguably we've already started seeing this movement happen in the last couple of years. 
at Singapore summit in 2018, Donald Trump already said that he wanted to provide security guarantees to the DPRK. And the North Korean foreign minister said security guarantee is the most important thing to us over sanction leave in the process of taking the denuclearization measure. And so while they're already stating that they want guarantees and they want more legally binding agreements to continue using negative security assurances as the forefront method for the proposals to address security aspects will only diminish in value and we cannot expect for it to bring up any positive results or move the discussion forward in a way that we are wanting to. And so I want to leave this presentation with this concluding statement and the fact that in a post-Russian invasion of Ukraine, negotiations that rely too heavily on utilizing negative security assurances as the forefront method for addressing security concerns over denuclearizing could continue to struggle in effectiveness. And while it's still arguable, if the development of stalling out of negotiations or increased need for a more substantial legal commitments will transpire, what is clear is that denuclearization negotiations are critically impacted and hindered in a post-Russia invasion, forcing the international community to address its effects in the way that it is trying to negotiate security aspects and denuclearizing. So I look forward to the further discussion in Q&A section, and thank you. All right, in, in that case, um, regarding the presentations, uh, I thought uh, Ms. Turkel and Professor Salik's uh, paper uh, talking about COVID-19 and uh, Ukraine vis-a-vis -vis North Korea um, made some interesting points. Uh, this idea that um, it kind of provided almost a impetus for further provocations and continuing down the path to a, a nuclear deterrence. Um, one thing, uh, though, that I'm curious, uh, there are a lot of people who are equating the invasion of Ukraine as somehow uh, providing North Korea with more motivation to get nuclear weapons. But uh, last time I checked, they've been pursuing nuclear weapons for decades. So. I'm I'm really curious, uh, just from uh, your perspective, uh, the invasion of Ukraine and COVID, like this, this kind of well, COVID is almost like a black swan event type thing. But uh, what did that change in the the calculus? Obviously, the motivation for for nuclear weapons, the threat perception, Ukraine showed that a big country could invade a small country. But I think we've known that for a while. So I'm I'm curious if there's anything in particular that changed the calculus for North Korea uh, following the Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine. I mean, Matthew uh, echoed what you had said about the, uh, the right for a preemptive nuclear strike in the being codified into law and the fact that North Korea's nuclear power or power status is enshrined in the constitution now. And we still live in a world where uh, there are a lot of countries who refuse to accept that North Korea is a nuclear power, which leads us into what Matthew was talking about with uh, the idea that a negative security guarantee or what we commonly refer to as a security assurance no longer holds the same value as it probably did in earlier rounds of nuclear negotiations with North Korea when pretty much the trust of larger powers following through on their negative security assurances has all been all but shattered. Uh, and North Korea was already quick to bring up the examples of Iraq or Libya whenever someone talked about denuclearization. So uh, the Ukraine and the fact that it's not the US this time just adds more fuel to their the, the fire of their their logic that uh, they should never give up nuclear weapons. As Matthew was saying that the value or belief in a negative security assurance is, has been greatly reduced. So I'm curious if, um, and I don't know if you've done any research or found any examples of this, which is why I'm asking, uh, what, if anything, do you think can be done to restore the value of a negative security assurance? Or are we simply is this just a sea change event in the Ukraine where we can no longer try to pull that out of our toolbox to entice countries to denuclearize? Um, and then on the other side, the, the positive security assurance or a security guarantee 
Um, I was just wondering if there is a, a, like a really like feel good success story about that working because we can, we can say that negative security assurances no longer work, but turning to positive security guarantees, if there's no really good case of that working, we're kind of left with, with, in a boat with no, with no oars. So I'm, I'm just curious if there's, if there's reason to hope for maybe a, a security guarantee focused agreement with North Korea. And that's the end of my question. So if anyone from the audience has a question for uh, our panelists. Uh, yeah, very interesting presentation. I just want to know, isn't the circumstances between de denuclearization between Ukraine and North Korea different in the sense that basically the nukes were kind of thrust upon Ukraine just by being part of the Soviet Union and like in the post-collapse era because they were such a poor country and trying to rebuild uh, themselves. They, I think they were more, it was more, more easier to push them into demoralization because they kind of didn't really want the nukes to the same extent that North Korea wants nukes. Isn't that like the biggest difference between these two situations? I'm Craig Boljevac from, I guess I'm associated with the Tsinghua University here. Um, also, maybe I didn't catch it, but um, Putin's threat to use nuclear weapons, did anyone sort of touch on how that destabilizes the international system in terms of deterrence in and of itself as well? And then furthermore, potentially legitimizing, further legitimizing in their eyes, North Korea's uh, push to, to have nuclear weapons in the first place. Because now we're seeing it almost as a regularization of, of war, where, which has never happened since the Korean War, at least when MacArthur threatened to use nuclear weapons, perhaps against China by the Yalu River and North River. So yeah, I'm just, I'm just wondering if anyone took that into account too. So I, I mean, I think that's an interesting point. Does deterrence have value if nuclear weapons are usable? Uh, Sila Salin or uh, Professor Salik, uh, do either of you care to respond to the questions? Oh. Thank you, Professor. I think uh, your, I mean, the first question of yourself was uh, related to any particular uh, sign uh, that North Korea uh, like showed maybe its intention to like uh, to show its uh, like, um, I mean, to show uh, its uh, in, um, eagerness to continue its nuclear weapon uh, policy. So actually, uh, we are continue. I mean, we are uh, we haven't finished the paper yet uh, because we are checking still the uh, the. Uh, for instance, the declarations of the North Korean regime, etc. But definitely, I mean, if if we can also take the examples of like Iraq and also the Libya cases, uh, this Ukraine crisis, or let's say the U Ukraine uh, war or intervention or invasion, however, uh, I mean, we prefer to call, it's definitely it definitely increased the uh, the North Korean regimes in a kind of like anxiety to uh, to not to give up the nuclear uh, weapons because it's it's definitely uh, created a kind of like idea if if the ukraine has uh, i mean had already had the, um, the nuclear weapons most probably it would be most more difficult for russia to intervene to the country so in this case uh, we believe that it's uh, it has created a kind of um, or let's say it fueled the anxiety of the north korean regime but uh, i think we we definitely have to check any other particular uh, like kind of maybe uh, discourse or definite, uh, let's say, statements from the North Korean regime too. But we will check uh, further uh, for this question, definitely. Thank you. Matthew, would you care oh, to yeah. respond? Yes. So starting with the first question about example of security guarantees, basically like, Okay, cool. So security, negative security assurances are devaluing what is actually the moving to security guarantees. Is there examples we can look to? What's the actual outlook? And I think the question can be considered to be quite bleak in the sense that if we move to these more legitimate security guarantees, the question we have to ask is who would be able to actually uphold a security guarantee that would give the DPRK what they're actually looking for? You know, in the sense that legitimizing the DPRK would not only be an action legitimizing any external threat, but would then also be legitimizing the Kim regime against internal threat. So it would have to be legitimizing any kind of uprising as then being a internal threat that would would then have to have this external actor get involved. 
would then what country would be able to protect themselves from who? Would the United States be guaranteeing no action against the DPRK from themselves, but who would then vindicate that? The EU, China? So the real question is, if we are trying to move to these positive assurances, the question is who would be able to actually offer that is not something that I think is a good answer. So I don't really have too much optimism about any type of assurance, to be honest. However, it's quite clear that negative assurances themselves have become quite obsolete in this sense for even if positive aren't going to be able to implement these ideals. And specifically, the question about relating Ukraine to the DPRK, uh, I agree. It's totally a different case. Each case has its own distinct negotiations, aspects that are important to them, and components that make them very complicated ideas. However, at the fundamental level of addressing security, which is what I this component we're talking about, security negative security assurances is the tool that is used to address this aspect for these negotiations. And that's where the similarities are aligned. So where they got their nukes is different. Of course, Ukraine inherited theirs while the DPRK has developed theirs. Their, their reasons for getting rid of them and their reasons for keeping them might differ. And the different components that are involved in the, in the negotiation process is different. However, what is not different is the security aspect and this having to address the security aspect. And through negotiations, negative assurances have been the method that is being utilized to address that aspect. And that's where their alignment and the observation analysis is important for us to understand. So I do agree they are very different cases, but for this aspect of negotiations and for this component that we're trying to look at, I think it's important to take note of. And the question about Putin's threats of utilizing nuclear weapons as legitimizing basically nuclear weapons, how does that affect the stability of the international order? And I think that is a difficult question to answer in a sense. And I think I did kind of touch on that earlier when I was talking about the dual role that nuclear deterrence plays, not only as a defensive tool, but also the shield that they like to hide be under, basically giving them the ability to invade other countries and hide behind their nuclear weapons, basically stating that if someone tries to attack them, then nuclear retaliation is probable. So I think the legitimization of Putin's threats of utilizing nuclear weapons does destabilize the international order in a way that we haven't seen in a while. However, I think it's a way that maybe is a way moving forward, such as we saw Trump basically doing the same thing. Sorry, President Trump doing the same thing when he tried to say that we will retaliate with fire and fury in his tweets. And so I think maybe this is an indicator of some kind of future movements and the way moving forward. Maybe the nuclear taboo has started to deteriorate to a level that we might have not recognized. And so I think it's too early to really say, but I think it's a good point to recognize. And so I, I, I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, I, I also think what part of Matthew's answer there was quite interesting, this idea like who guarantees security? And, you know, there isn't... You know, if you if you studied international studies even a little bit, you know that there is no overarching power that that serves that role for us the way that police do within a state. And you know, a lot of people like to sneeringly refer to America as the world police sometimes, but uh, I don't think anyone in America ever volunteered for that role. So how can you guarantee security? And if you were to guarantee security, are you married to the person that you're guaranteeing security for no matter what they do? Because I think on the international stage, even a, a positive security guarantee, the state would be looking like, oh, well, you can never break this promise. Otherwise your promise is no good and we're back to being insecure. But if we look on a societal level, you know, the police protects you, but if you break the law, then you're in trouble, right? So I don't know that there's a mechanism in international politics or international security that would that serve the same function. So, you know, it it seems like a simple question, but who guarantees security is actually a really complex and challenging one. I think. Also, just one of the, there's also the debate about like America sending funding to Ukraine. The people who are like against funding say that like, America has no obligation to Ukraine. But the people that are pro funding, they say, but well, we push them into like side of the Budapest moratorium. So that, in a sense, is us promising that we would help Ukraine if the worst case scenario happened. So.
Okay. It seems to be the thing that was the time that is. Can I just say uh, something to uh, Matthew Singh quickly before Bernard? Yeah. Uh, uh, Matthew, my one distinction would be Putin's threat is in the contents, context of an active war against Ukraine. Trump's threat, I wouldn't call it an idle threat, but was not in that context. And yes, the Americans have fought a lot of wars since World War II, but in that particular time period, there wasn't. So, so that to me, it, where it's a f order of magnitude more real a threat than some rhetorical back and forth from a populist. President. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okay. I, I'm Bernard Seliger from Unsidal Foundation. And I would even propose here that North Korea has no interest in a security guarantee because a security guarantee, which would really take away the threat, the external threat, would mean there would be no more reason for internal control of the population. Large part of the control of population works now under the name of we are still in a war. That is, we go still into the bunker and do one or two or three day um, um, exercises there that people bring their own food, which they often don't have or so, which is completely different than here. Here, the, the so-called armistice is a peace, but in North Korea, it is still there on war footing all the time. And it gives the government a lot of possibility to uh, exert control over the population. So I don't think they are unhappy with the threat. And they are, that's why I, where I see also many of the provocations come from. They want to uh, hold the threat alive. Mm -hmm. Sorry. The, the coercive apparatus of North Korea definitely do play a dual function, both internal and external, that a lot of people tend to uh, see one very clearly and then the other one does not, it kind of hides in the shadows. Mm -hmm. Um, Matt, did you have something to say? Sorry. Oh, yeah, I was just going to follow up on that. Um, and that was the um, concept that I was alluding to about providing security guarantee, not only from the external threat, from its own internal threat, because if you're legitimizing basically this regime and then their threat about utilizing why we have to act the way we act, why we're doing, do you then have to protect themselves from any kind of civil uprising or from kind of civil war, or guerrilla warfare, or whatever could transpire? And so I do agree that I think the security guarantee component is mostly a front. I don't believe that they ever want to give up their pursuit of trying to become a normal nuclear state. I mean, just look at the last couple of months with the ICBM tests, shooting missiles over Japan, threatening to redo their nuclear testing underground. Like there's obviously a continuous movement towards negotiation stalling out completely. Again, with this new law, I'm pretty sure it bans any kind of negotiations over de denuclearizing in general. So I think we're moving towards one of the heightened positions that we have been over these negotiations, especially with like the Yoon's administration talking about the kill chain idea as well as even starting to float around the concept of stationing bombers and submarines from the US on South Korea again. So I think we're moving in a direction that I think is just more of a complete stalling out of negotiations in general and not coming to the table. And so the question is, is the US or the Western world or NATO or the EU or whoever ready to accept the DPRK as a nuclear state? Like, are we ready to move past trying to negotiate and redefine the concepts, I think, that were addressed in the other presentation about what is a non-nuclear state and what is a nuclear state, and should we be containing these same types of titles still, or should we try to be evolving these titles? Mr. Keller, Professor Salik, uh, would you care to answer the question in the Q&A? Thank, uh, thank you, Professor. Actually, uh, yeah, especially the one that I saw in the chat part uh, regarding that Ukraine and North Korea quite different examples. Actually, I totally agree with the Matthew uh, answer, but also I think when we when we talk about the security guarantee, I think we also should consider this the regime, I mean, the regime's security guarantee, because I think uh, what the North Korea means, uh, or they say North Korea things about when we say the security guarantee, mostly it's re related to the family. I mean, the regime's uh, security maybe, because uh, in, the, in the summits between Trump and uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, I mean, I think I think one of the issues was definitely to uh, to secure the, the the future of the regime, or let's say the, the future of the family. So in this sense, uh, as you mentioned, definitely like legitimizing the nuclear weapon program in North Korea, or uh, as one of the professors in the room mentioned, uh, that they are happy with the external threats, so that they are uh, they keep uh, their position. Uh, 
internally, I mean, during the, so the I mean, at the societal level, it's definitely uh, a, a very good point because uh, as long as you have the external threats, uh, it's it's a way of legitimizing your position and uh, like your to to legitimize your control over your own society. So in this sense, uh, I'm not so quite sure whether the North Korean regime <clears throat> uh, is willing to. Uh, to get rid of these all like external threats too. So in this sense, it, it's I mean it's a good uh, reflection, and I think we have to should I mean we should consider this point uh, in our uh, papers when we are uh, like uh, finishing our papers too. So in this sense, I would like to thank you very much for the uh, for the for the professors who uh, made like quite considerable uh, points uh, for the Q and A session. Um, were there any more questions from the floor? Anyone in the back? Sorry, I'm a graduate student at Aeon Savings Cluster. Um, looking at the links between uh, Ukraine and uh, North Korea and, and Russia, um, I was just wondering, is um, North Korea appears sometimes uh, to be uh, is reacting to what's happening in Ukraine, but I also wanted to ask whether it is also part of um, instigating what's happening in Ukraine in terms of, has Putin seen what's happened with Kim Jong-un's nuclear brinkmanship style, and it's seen that as a source of perhaps inspiration for his own style. I believe in uh, January 2018, when um, when Kim Jong-un was like um, really hyping up tensions, especially like a lot of missile tests, uh, that gained a lot of like US attention. And I think two months later, um, uh, Putin said in like a, a speech in front of the Federal Assembly that, um, <coughs> sorry, that um, he, he really like praised um, uh, Kim Jong-un for this. And he also, he demonstrated that uh, a, a simulation of the US, um, an attack on the US and nuclear strikes. And he said that this was the way to get attention. Do you think these have like led up and actually he's seen what's happened in North Korea and that's the way to get attention with the West by tightening tensions? Do you think that's um, part of the reason uh, we're in this situation in Ukraine? Uh, yeah, like, it's, it's a very, very tough question. Let, let me think a few seconds at least. Um, if, if I can just jump in, Mm -hmm. um, this is something that has occurred to me before that when you have a small country, a weak country, a poor country like North Korea that is able to throw its weight around and launch as many missiles as it wants and, you know, provoke South Korea, Japan and the US and literally get away with it with very little in the way of repercussions. I know sanctions, but especially now with uh china and russia having their back there's there's very like for for a country that is so minute compared to like the the power of the u.s to be able to do these things i mean if you were xi jinping and you were vladimir putin we go oh well he can do that let's, let's you know what i can do because i actually have a real military with some you know clout behind it and i have a much bigger tested nuclear arsenal so I can get away with a lot more too. <clears throat> I mean, it's a, it's more of a psychology question than a, than a political science question, but I think that would be a definite temptation. Uh, I was there like until very recently, I, I found it ironic that more people were concerned about North Korea than China, because China is also a nuclear power and it's way bigger threat to Western interests and US interests than North Korea is, but there was never really any serious talks about denuclearizing China because we kind of figure it's a done deal. It's not, nothing's going to change. But now I think there's more concern about that because of the whole Taiwan issue. There's a question of like, will China use nukes in the event of like uh, invasion of Taiwan or war with Taiwan? So I think the calculus has changed because, you know, you know, authoritarian leaders always say it will do things, but we always say, well, it's just safer. Like, they're not going to actually do it. But right. now that Putin actually did it, we have to take what Kim Jong-un says seriously about uh, you know, antagonizing South Korea, we have to take what Xi Jinping says seriously about Taiwan. Well, I, I also think what Craig said earlier, uh, that there's a kernel in there that you can draw upon where, you know, Trump threatening fire and fury and Putin threatening nuclear war, the situation is vastly different. Uh -huh. So it is, it is definitely different in terms of what the threat level is. But also like culturally between an authoritarian regime and a democratic regime. If a, if a president in a democratic country threatens nuclear war, they're going to they're gonna hear about it from all sides within a, at least a real democracy. But there's no, there's no breaks on, on the power for a Putin or a Xi or a Kim Jong-un. And if they wanted to, 
they could. They could give that order and nothing would stop them. So yeah. if I could I, just react one thing about what you said. The original established nuclear powers for many decades have been China, US, Russia, UK, France, okay, more minor. But what you're saying is challenging the status quo that was hither, hitherto unbreakable. You know, we have Israel with nuclear weapons, that's obvious. We have China or Pakistan and India that have gradually been brought in. But this is North Korea's whole argument is that, okay, if you're going to talk about Chinese denuclearization, what about American denuclearization? Yeah. So that puts the whole equation on the table for every country that has nuclear weapons. And you, I don't think you'll ever see that day. The first time. And then also now South Korea, there's such high support for the Absolutely. Absolutely. In Japan, yeah. 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 <laughs> and if like South Korea gets nuclear weapons, it kind of makes the whole conversation. Yeah. Then it's over the non-proliferation regime, if you ask me. I will try to say something. Sorry. Uh, if I uh, truly understand the conversations, maybe I can add something to taking attention. Uh, I think North Korea has tried to take attention because uh, what um, they do other than the nuclear weapons. For example, North, uh, South Korea have soft power economy, but North Korea have uh, difficult issues in the in domestic domestically difficult issues, some humanitarian issues, economic issues, but uh, they have huge, they have to show huge missiles. Okay, I mean, definitely, they're, they're going with what they're good well, at, I think. Unless there are any other questions or comments, points we want to bring up. Silu Selim Turkel and uh, Professor Hati Salik, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we appreciate your time and, and your participation. Uh, Matthew, thank you for joining us as well. Uh, thank you to our audience members.